what their ancestors went through, what their, with all those things, you know, uh, of the, what the people of God went through to get where they are today. And that's beautiful. We need that more and more. Amen? Amen. So I thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Hallelujah. So you can start the recording now. Hallelujah. So on Sunday, what I did was I talked about, um, you know, the armor of God in the respect of the breastplate of righteousness. Um, As I said, you know, some people may go a little too far in either direction, you know, talking too much about, um, you know, the physicalities of the armor and also to the location of the armor. But what Paul is just so awesome in doing is that he himself is in chains and yet he finds an opportunity to encourage the church, which is in Ephesus. And the way that he does that is he uses what's, you know, a parable, what's around him. And he sees his soldier outside of his cell and he begins to write to the Ephesians and tell them about this armor that God had. The Holy Spirit has showed him something that is absolutely imperative, something that is absolutely necessary to be able to withstand the wiles of the, of, against the wiles of the devil, right? You know, one thing I pointed out about this verse on Sunday is it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I pointed out the part that it says, may be able to. Then I went a little bit farther into the, uh, you know, there was a, a church, Israel, right? The kingdom of God. And uh, in, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, they're going out before an army. And the Philistine army and the Israelite army are met there. At, they're both on the top of a hill, and the battlefield is in the center of the ground, right there in the center of the valley. How many of you know that there was two camps that were clothed for war at that time? But there was no fighting going on. And, you know, I said, what, what a shame that would be if we have all these awesome classes about the armor. We learn about the attributes that Paul is trying to, you know, communicate to us through the, the breastplate of righteousness, you know, the helmet of salvation, all those different things that we need to survive the attacks of the enemy and to overcome those things. But we just simply choose not to fight. We just simply choose not to fight, right? You know, I love that story that Pastor Mario was telling us because it, t- it shows us where to pray. There's something that's happening in the body of Christ where it is, you know, it, people are, they know the Word of God, they read the Word of God, they may even pray a little bit, but yet that's all that they do. They don't fight, they don't, they don't stand, you know, they, they, don't, they don't withstand the attacks of the enemy. They're just like every other person, but yet they will tell you that they're a Christian. And you would have no idea that anything was different about them except the fact that they opened their mouth and told you. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that kind of a person. I don't want to be that kind of father. I don't want to be that kind of husband. I don't want to be that kind of brother in Christ. I love you guys too much to give you that kind of Christianity. I love you guys too much to give you that kind of false hope and security. Here I am standing here about to read the Word of God. Do you guys deserve that? Absolutely not. Do I deserve that from you? Absolutely not. You know, I love the leadership that we have here at this church because they are unique and so awesome. They realize one thing that I think a lot of churches miss in in their leadership is that not only is it their job to push us, but it's our job to push them. Amen? What an opportunity that we get to sit here and teach the Word of God to our pastors. And they hear and they encourage us. And we encourage them. I don't know, isn't that what the body of Christ is I've been to a lot of churches I've been to a lot of places and it's, it's just so awesome that we get to experience that here and we get to see the fullness of who God is through his body you know because there's at times you know just even you think of your physical body where you know a, a certain member may need more attention you know when Pastor Jim hurt, hurt his shoulder, you know, I'm using it as an example, right? He hurt his shoulder. That shoulder needed a little bit more attention than, say, his foot. There was a need in his body that he had to tend to at the moment. Likewise, there was needs in the church. And this is why we are learning about the armor, right? This is why we're learning about that. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. That one's free. I just came full circle there. 
They realize that there's a need in the body, and that's why we're on the armor of God. So let me ask you this question. Was the armor of God only for the Ephesians? Absolutely not, because first of all, I'm reading it right now, right? I get to read this word, but it's also for the Thessalonians. If you would turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, and I actually pointed this out to my wife. I said, oh no, do you think he got it wrong when he said this? So if you turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, and then we're going to go to 8 and 9. And this will show you show you the importance of the foundation here of what what we are uh, talking about here. But it says, "But let us." And who is he talking about? Us, the saved ones. Amen. Let us who are of the day. Well, that's a little obvious. Be sober. That's another sermon in itself. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet. Hope of salvation. So he's still the, the helmet is still salvation, right? But if you see there, you're probably thinking, wait, I thought the breastplate was righteousness. But in here, it's faith and love. You know, Paul is so amazing because he in this in this moment he's playing the role of an evangelist. He's able to speak to the need of that specific community. In one community, their need was to know guard your heart with righteousness. That is something that your your community and your culture is struggling with. So that's what you need to guard your heart with. In this community here, what he's talking about is he said, you know what, guard your heart with love and faith. But he still is concerned about their spiritual well-being. He's still concerned about this fight that wants to not only destroy the church, but consume their very souls. Because the devil just doesn't want to simply distract us. That's just the first step in this plan, right? That's just the first step where we walk away from the faith, you know? To say, hey, I have to take care of this for just a moment. The church will understand. Well, let me tell you something the church also understands. That the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? That's something else that the church realizes, right? Or should realize it. So again, one thing that I that I shared uh, previously to this is that, um, you know, although Paul did use the physicality of the armor as a um, something to get his point across, this scripture is about righteousness, and I'm going to go a little bit into more detail about like the heart and the lungs because that is that those are the areas that the uh, that the breastplate covers. And you know, one thing, and I, I didn't do this last week, so I'll do it this week. Uh, one thing the, about the breastplate that is so awesome is that there are opportunities for access. There's opportunities for access. There's no part of your body that's 100% secure, right? Because what did I say? The armor is not for 100% protection. It's to assist you when you're in battle, right? It's to help you fight. It's for fighting. It's not like a secret bubble, you know, where you just go away and nothing can touch you. It's an invisibility cloak. It's, it's a tool. It's something that you use in combat. It's something that you're supposed to use to engage the enemy, right? So how many of you know when that's true that there are opportunities for things to get in? Now, this is something that's key here is that because it's all about proximity. So, Joe, can you come here for a minute, please? you stand over there, please? Okay, I want you to tell me how dangerous Joe is to me right now. None, right? Okay, how about now? No, right? You stretch your hand out? Can't touch me, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> how about now? Let me see, reach your hand out. Nah, I'm getting closer to danger. How about now, right? This is the danger zone, right? <laughs> So it's all it's all compared. It, it's all about proximity. So first of all, how close are you letting the enemy get to you? How close is your enemy to you? Right? Because there's very. Uh, thank you. I just I I'm, I, I exploited his size uh, for that example. Thank you, Joe. Um, 
I'm glad I got a bigger brother. Amen. Uh, but, you know, how many of you know that it depends on how close your enemy is to you? Because there might be some gaps. You know, if you have a moment of doubt, there might be a gap. You know, you can liken that onto, you know, hey, your, 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 your thing isn't stitched up correctly, you know. Or, or, it, or you're barely putting it on, or you're barely trying to, you know, it's like David when he put that armor on, you know. It, it had a plan, it had a purpose, but yet it wasn't tried, it wasn't tested. It wasn't something that he was familiar with using. So when you start to begin to get into those things, realize that you're going to get attacked. When you start realizing what the armor of God is and you start to engage the enemy, realize that it's new territory and you're going to get attacked. You're going to get discouraged. You're going to want to give up. Do not give up. Do not give in. Do not quit. Amen? Because, let me tell you, even as David did not have that armor tried, fast forward, what, 20, 30 years? Oh, he was a master of the sword. He was the master of the javelin and the spear. He was the master of all of those things that he could not master at that point in time. The Bible says that he was a man of war. Absolutely. Probably like five foot, nothing, you know? But still the most dangerous man at that time, I would say. When he was a boy, right? Because he, he mastered what he had. He mastered what he had. That's something different about David. He mastered what he had. If it was an instrument, he mastered it to the point that when he played his harp and sang his songs, that the evil spirits had no choice but to flee. When he had his rocks, right? When he had his sling, he mastered it to the point where a well-trained soldier could not stand against him, right? When he had his sword, when he had maybe even a little bit of men that were behind him, he was discouraged. You know, what comes to mind is the, the little skirmish where they take all his women and his children and all his men's women and children and they take everything and they come back to their camp and it's like, where's everybody at? No one's there. Right? What an amazing time for discouragement. What an amazing time to be disappointed and to give up. But it was at that moment that he encouraged himself in the Lord. And he was able to praise through that discouragement. And he was able to master that moment. And I love God because it's not even so much that, that David was an excellent warrior. Yes, he was. But it was like through the most ridiculous type of intelligence that he happened to know where his enemy was. It's just like, you know... Ah, oh, that guy's a loser. We don't want you in our camp anymore. Get out of here, you know? And it's like, wow, they just left him for dead, you know? And then here comes the, the David and his army ready to get back what they stole. And they happen upon this guy. And he goes, don't kill me. I'll tell you where everything is. Right? That is so goofy. But yet, God put that in, 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 his, in his way there, you know? He showed that man mercy. And because of his mercy, whose mercy? Not David's mercy, but because of God's mercy, he was able to recover everything that was taken from him. Because of God's mercy. Amen? I know the situation looks like it was David against, you know, the army, the Philistines, all those people, and, and you know, what was going on at that time. But it was actually God's mercy towards David, and he was able to accomplish that. Amen. So another scripture, because we're talking about righteousness, that I, I truly love, and I always go back to and I read, it's Psalms 1. Every time I think I've read this too many times, I read it one more time. Because in there it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit it in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. The ungodly, not so. 
are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Hello, if you're wondering who's the righteous, go back and read the other first three verses. <laughs> but it says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Which way? The way of the first three verses. <laughs> but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You know, I tried to over-exaggerate uh, that point a little bit, but if you ever want to know what the definition of what uh, of, of getting the fruit of righteousness is, look at those first three verses. Do those, and you're on a good way. <laughs> when, you, when your heart's desire, what you delight in, is to read God's Word and to meditate on His Word, and that's all you want to do day and night, day and night. Amen? Day and night. I think I used this as an example on Sunday. I'll do it again. You know, one, one thing that the, uh, the people, when, the, when all the satraps and all those other guys, you know, all the, the magistrates and the governors and the, the, the chiefs and the priests and all that, you know, anybody who's anybody came and met secretly. You know, if you read in the book of Daniel, and it talks about how they met secretly. And they, they came before the king and they said, Oh, king. We have a decree that we'd like you to pass. We want you to be king just for 30 days. We want you to be God. That's something that in their culture was okay, that the king could be God. And they said, you know, we want, we've all come together, which was a lie because Daniel wasn't there. We all came together, right? Are you catching it? <laughs> which was a lie because Daniel wasn't there. and He was the most important out of all of them, but he wasn't there. And, uh, you know, so he said, hey, we got this, this decree, and we want you to be God. And he said, okay, that's not against my religion, of course, because he's a pagan, and that's something that's acceptable in their culture. Absolutely, I would like to do that. And the reason why they had to come up with that request is because that was the only accusation that they can find against Daniel. That's it. was his relationship with his God. That's it. That's the only fault that they could find with him was his relationship with God. I don't know. I don't know about you, but that's not that's not the only accusation they would come up with against me, right? Is just to say, hey, you worship the Lord too much, you serve him too much, that's all you talk. They I have other issues. I'll just say like I have other issues. That is amazing. That just blows my mind that there could be a man so righteous, so holy, that all these people gather together and do lots of digging for decades. And all they can find out what's wrong with this guy is, man, he really does love his God. Decades. Decades. He's went through multiple kings at this point in time government rises up you know then this guy takes over then that guy takes over and he served under all of them and they went through all the records and all they can find out is he really loves his god he doesn't drink he doesn't smoke doesn't chase strange women he just loves god too much and he will not give in to anything so what do they do they devise a trap they say you know what if anybody hears these sounds and they don't bow down, let's throw them in the lines then. Hey, I'll sign that, right? Signs it. Until the very moment when it happens. And they say, hey, look, this is the guy. This is the one. And the king realized at that point in time, first of all, he loved Daniel. He had a, he had a, a special place in his heart for Daniel. And when he realized that, you know what, what I signed was going to cause this man's demise. The Bible says that he didn't sleep. The king could not sleep. He sat there and fasted and prayed and interceded on his behalf. And he waited and waited and waited for that sun to come up. And when it came up, he's like, all right, let's go down to the lines now. Let's check. Daniel, are you there? He's screaming in there. You know, hey, are you there? Anybody home? And what an amazing reply. He said, King, I'm fine. I'm all right. 
And you know, I, I love the king's response. Because it, the Bible is so awesome and descriptive. Because he's sitting there saying, wow, this guy is okay. And he pulls out his pen. This is my pen. And he starts to write. And he's telling the, everybody, he goes, call everybody here so that we can see if, if Daniel's here. And then they see him and then he's going, okay. And they go, well, king, what are you going to do? And he goes, um, and he's writing while he's talking. And you might think, well, that's rude. But there's a purpose to this. Because what he's writing is that, okay, you guys that threw Daniel in the lion's den, you are going to be thrown in the lion's den. And let's see what your God does for you. And then he stamps it. And then, he's, then, then they cry out for mercy and say, no, just expel us. You'll never see us again. And he says, I'm sorry. It's already written. I can't. I can't go back on that. Just like you knew that when it became a law, when I signed it, I couldn't go back and have mercy on Daniel, even though the king wanted to have mercy on him and go back on that decree. There was something in his culture, in his leadership, in his customs that he could not betray what he had written. But there was something greater than that at that moment in time. It was his God. So with the same likeness, he goes and signs that and says, well, let's see what your gods are going to do for you. And the Bible says that even before they met the ground, they were caught in the air by the lions. And not only that, it describes that their bones were crushed. And that was the end. Amen? So that is the righteous fight. Amen? So to some, it may look like chasing Goliath with a stone. To some, it may be simply praying. And I love the scripture because when it describes Daniel, it says that he, he, he kneeled down and prayed just as he was accustomed to. That wasn't the time to start praying three times a day. That was the time to continue what he was already doing. Amen. So that's why these classes are important. That's why it's important to read your word and to dig into the word. So that way, when you get to the point where it's a trial and tribulation, you're not trying to do something new. You're just trying to maintain what you've already been doing. Amen. So I said I'm going to talk about the heart. The heart is something that is paramount to our existence. You know, there, the, the Bible talks about the heart as in the spiritual terms. Um, you know, it, it's, it's something that God works with. You know, it says that God draws the heart, all, all men unto himself. You know, that's where he stands at the door of our heart and knocks, you know. So we have that poetic version of a heart, you know, like it, it, it's the entrance to God coming into our lives. But how many of you know that there's a physical nature of the heart as well? Amen. So you can't, you, you can't have one without the other. So I'm going to talk about the physical nature of the heart. So um, kind of like in my medical background, you know, I got to learn in great gross detail the necessities of what your heart and the way that it works. So I'll go a little bit greater into detail of that. I did a little bit on Sunday, but let's go a little bit farther. Uh, so, you have four chambers of your heart, right? And you have two that fire, you know, your ventricles, the lower part, and you have your atrium. And I know my mother-in-law knows this. She, if she, anybody knows anything about the heart, it's her. Uh, but the way that it works is, uh, you know, there's this thing where, like, we used to do is that, you know, like, the bump, and then this, you know, and then that's the way, you know, that's the way your heart works, you know? The lower part, the upper part, the lower part, the upper part, the lower part, the upper part, the lower part, your upper part. You know, and if you have a heart, you know, condition, you might, you know, you know, and then it's just like all messed up. You get all dizzy. That's where people can't exercise and, you know, they can't function normally, right? In the spirit as well, you can have a little bit of a murmur or a heart condition where you may not be able to function as you should. So, the main purpose, it's like an electrical center, you know, it's, it's a move by electrical impulses, uh, you know, and that's where people, uh, for some reason, they're getting misfiring signals, you know, you got like a quivering leg, or, you know, in my example here, um, you have like a misfire, and that's where they give you what's called a pacemaker, and that is to send an electrical charge to your heart and say, hey, quit acting up. And then your heart's like, okay, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll start bumping right, you know. So then it gets back in that rhythm, and then you, you, you begin to function, you know. 
And uh, we're all familiar with the TV shows where you see the little boop, you know, boop. And it goes boop. And they go, oh, okay, clear, let's pow. Let me tell you something. That's TV, okay? When it goes boop, you don't, that means you're dead. You don't shock dead people. They're dead. That's it. Okay? So if I go visit somebody and I see boop, I'm going to be like, Lord, he was a good person. That's it. <laughs> you know, that's it. If you are having an event where your your heart may not be functioning correctly and you'll have, you know, like a little quiver or something, that's when you shock somebody to restart the process. And it's like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. How many times does it seem like you're going through something, you're going through life, and it's like the Spirit of God just comes along and just zaps you? You might be quivering in one spot. You might be quaking in another area. And the Spirit of the Lord just comes along and says, hey, act right. I thank God for that. Because there's another point that you can get to, if you see where I'm going with this, where in the Spirit you'll be like, boop. And we'll be like, man, that guy used to serve the Lord. And now he doesn't. Right? So that's why it's so important and all those things. And then also to the lungs. This is what I love. God designed us with the plan and a purpose. Our bodies function the way that God designed them to. The human body is an amazing miracle that no matter how much understanding people have or think they will have, it just shows us how much we do not know. You know, I remember learning things. I thought I had a grasp on things. and I see things and do things and I would just be like, wow, I don't know anything. You know, you learn, you read for hours and study for years and you just realize that, man, I still don't know how stuff works. But yet God, he just got some dust together, made some lungs. Do you know, do you know what a negative pressure system is? What a negative pressure system is. So, so there's like, there's this whole thing that's like called atmospheric pressure all around us. So if you're ever going up a mountain and your ears pop, that's called atmospheric pressure. Your body, your internal mechanisms are, you know, making your equilibrium in your ears, you know, to that pressure. Same thing like if you're in a plane, right? Your lungs have the same exact mechanism. They're designed with a negative pressure. What does that mean? It's that your body is specifically designed that when you breathe all your air out, you have a negative pressure, and air wants to run in and fill that cap up. You were designed to made to want to breathe. Isn't that amazing? God designed us so that we wouldn't have to think to breathe, but when we breathe out, the natural surroundings of what God created and the way that he designed us causes us to breathe in again. I'm like, God... That is amazing. That is awesome. I'm just like, God, you're so awesome. I don't know any man or a single-celled organism that could come up with a better way of doing things than that. I mean, you know what? I told my, just a side note here, uh, my, my, I told my niece, I said, Veronica, you know, when you're in school, they teach you about evolution. You know, people come from monkeys. And you tell them that, you know, God created all people, and they look at you like you're crazy. And I say, okay, fine then. You want me to believe that I came from a monkey, but yet I believe that I serve a living and loving God that looked down on earth and designed us with a purpose and breathed life into us and sent his son to die on the cross so that we can be with him. And I'm crazy. Here's a banana. Like, you know, it's just like, come on. Like, what are you, what are you, <laughs> what are we missing here? I mean, like, how beautiful is the story of our faith, but yet I'm the one who's a little bit off? I'm the one who's off? I, I, what am I missing? You know, I'm just like, wow. I love the, the God loves us story. God chose us story. God created us. God breathed life into us. That is much greater than an, a science experiment, you know? It's just by accident. A whole bunch of chemicals came together and some electricity added. It doesn't work like that. You know? They can't recreate that. They can't recreate us. Isn't that amazing? You know, 
So again, with the, with the negative pressure system in our lungs, another amazing attribute that, that is there, there can be an inter interruption. I mean, you know, they're, 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 you know um, you can get like a gunshot wound, you can get stabbed, you can, I know these are a little bit graphic examples, but you don't have to have a physical opening in your body to interrupt the system. Did you know that? So you could be, let's say, skateboarding, and you fall down, you break your rib. And because you broke your rib, the way that I'll explain the lungs is that, you know, you have like a little sac here and it, and it opens up and it has that negative pressure, you know, system. And there's a lot of stuff that I can go into detail about, like, you know, people have asthma, they have breathing issues, things that way. But what it is, it's a bag that's around that, that system and it's called the parietal pleura. So it's, it's in that sac, you know. You know, you see the thoracic cavity, you see the ribs, you see like a little lining, then you see another lining, and then you see the lungs. If there's a tear in that, that interrupts the negative pressure. And what happens? Air starts to run in through that area. And that very beautiful mechanism that God has created to make us breathe will collapse your lung. And that will cause what's called asphyxiation. You will suffocate. And you're thinking, oh, you know, that that's why, I mean, nobody lets their kids play with plastic bags or anything or anything like that, right? For that very reason, right? You know, hey, you don't even see a kid with a bag on their head. It's the first, oh, you're going to suffocate. You know, you have to protect that. We have that instinctual nature to protect breath, Right? So again, I'll ask you, how close are you letting your enemy to you? It may not be close enough to strike you and to penetrate the armor, but is it close enough to wound you? Is it close enough to get into, into this beautiful system that God has designed? Is it close enough to get into your doctrine? Right? You know, I think about Thomas, and I say, I say, you know what? He had an amazing opportunity to doubt his doctrine because he said, you know what? I want to see God, and I want to see Jesus when I see him, and I put my hand in his side, and I put my hand in his hands, and I see the holes, then I'll believe it. How faithful is God that he appeared to Thomas? How faithful is God that he appeared to Thomas? Because he, did, he didn't need to do that. But yet he chose to appear to him. You know, there were some people that saying, you know, Jesus isn't resurrected. It's in the Bible. Jesus isn't resurrected. They just moved his body. They stole his disciples, went and stole his body. And that's the way the Jews feel still to this day, right? How detrimental to the faith would it have been if he did not appear to Thomas? If Thomas would have said, you know what, I, don't I, I remember seeing God. I remember being with him. I remember praying with him. I remember hearing his words. But he didn't come back from the dead. How devastating to the faith would that be? And that, that is not a, a, a crushing blow, but that is a damaging blow to the point where you will suffocate. So that's why one of my uh, favorite scriptures is Jude one twenty to build yourselves up in your most holy faith and to pray in the Holy Spirit. Because your faith is sacred. You have to protect it. At the beginning of uh, that chapter, in, in my Bible, there's a little short commentary, and I want to read that because I was uh, remembering that it was there, and I was just like, man, God, you're so good. Because when it says, you know, the epistle of Jude, and this is unless you have this exact Bible, it's not going to be in there, but I'll read what they, they felt necessary to add before, you know, the background of what Jude was. It says, fight, contend, do battle. When an apostasy rises... When false teachers emerge, when the truth of God is attacked, it is time to fight for the faith. And then it says, only believers who are spiritual, spiritually, and then in quotes it says, in shape, can answer the summons. At the beginning of this letter, Jude focuses on the believers common salvation but then feels compelled to challenge them to contend for their faith the danger is real it's absolutely real false teachers have crept into the church not just back then 
have crept into the church, turning God's grace into unbounded license to do as they please. But Jude reminds such men of God's past dealings with unbelieving Israel, disobedient angels, and the wicked Sodom and Gomorrah. In the face of such danger, Christians should not be caught off guard. The challenge is great, but so is the God who is able to keep them from stumbling. I was like, man, that's a sermon all by itself. So. <laughs> the challenge is great, but so is the God who is able to keep them from stumbling. And that's something that Paul realized while he was shackled and chained, is that he realized that, you know what? The battle is great, but God is greater. He's giving us these spiritual things that we can fight with. We can stand in righteousness. We can stand clothed. Amen? We can stand guarding. I mean, how awesome is that, that He would choose to use righteousness to guard our hearts in the very breath that God has put in us, right? Those are sacred things, not only physically necessary for life, but they're sacred when the Bible talks about them. Our heart and our lungs, the breath that God has placed into us. And that is something that righteousness is absolutely paramount. It has to be there to guard those things for us. And then also, too, like I said in... Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, where it talks about faith and love. Amen. Also important attributes to guard us. So hallelujah. I just thank God for the opportunity I had to stand before you and talk about His Word. You know, I, I, I live in a generation, but I live in, 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 I live in a generation and outside of a generation at the same time. And, uh, hey, you want to teach a little bit? <laughs> it's like, no. Maybe that. They're getting close. <laughs> I live in a generation and then also out of a generation at the same time. The reason why I say that is because, first of all, I serve God. So I'm at an advantage to where I can see things for what they are. Uh, we get to read the Word of God and see that that's the truth of what reality is versus what we see with our eyes and we feel with our bodies and our natural senses and we see on TV and all those things. That is, those are the things that are fleeting. Those are the things that are foolish and childish and one day will pass away. But yet the Word of God will stand forever. So the reason why I say I, I'm in a generation but also out of a generation because once we are transformed into that uh, you know, marvelous light, it's like we're entering eternal. Like we're, we're like a, a, a new creation, one that will never pass. This body will pass away from us and I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad. This thing, I mean, it looked better when I was younger, but I mean, gosh, I can't wait to get up out of this play, you know, out of this body and into my new one. <laughs> and to be able to see, you know, like just look at the glory of God. You know, I can't even stare at a computer screen for a, such a long amount of time or my eyes begin to bother me. But there will be a body that we will be equipped with, that we will begin to able to see the glory of God. Not like in this secondhand glory when it fills the room, but His true glory. Man, these eyes of flesh here, oh my gosh, they could not even begin to stand. My body would just fall apart. You know, the Bible talks about Moses when he saw the backside. You know, when, when he just saw like a glimpse, just a shadow, nothing, just a little bit. His countenance. The people couldn't even look at him. They couldn't look at Moses who looked at God. That is glory. That is glory. And we'll be able to see him in the fullness of of His justice, His judgment, His mercy, His grace, His unending faithfulness and kindness. We'll get to see the reward of the just and the unjust. We'll be able to see the fruits of the just and the unjust. We'll be able to see all those things because God is just not one-sided. 
The same God. Oh, man, God is so amazing. God is so awesome. The same God of love is the same God of judgment. The same God that will say, come to me, my son. Amen. Is the same God that will take out his sword and cut off that unfruitful branch. That's the God that we serve. And you know what? It may seem harsh to the one who's being cut off. But the thing is this. God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that everyone through him might be saved. Right? We all know John 3.16, right? What's John 3.17, right? <laughs> right? He didn't come to just condemn the world. He could have did that a long time ago. But he came that the world may be saved through him. Through his son. How awesome is that? So I'm just I'm just encouraged. I, I can't wait to hear the next couple of messages coming up. One, because I'm not teaching them, and two, because I know God is doing something greater than we could even imagine. You know, I, I don't think that we, we get these unctions and uh, from the Holy Spirit uh, to open his word just for no reason. But I believe that there's something out there that's happening, and if you aren't seeing it. You know, what I said on Sunday is that you're, you're in a war. Whether you believe it or not, you're in a war. The question is, will you fight in the war? And you know, there's plenty of people fighting, but what side of that fight are you on? Are you fighting with the Lord or are you fighting against the Lord? There's no other way. That's it. Either you're hot or you're cold, right? Those that are lukewarm, they just get spewed out. They just get spewed out. But amen. I'm, I'm so grateful that God uh, allowed me to share what uh, what he showed me and uh, what he would have me say. Um, I want to leave you with this. You know, the book of Jonah is a good example of what righteousness is. And some of you might be thinking, oh, Jonah was a righteous man. But I'm talking about Nineveh. <laughs> they had an opportunity to make a decision. And to make things right. And God didn't have a problem with that. But it seems like the prophet, the man of God, had a problem with that. Right? Oh, geez. We still have those problems sometimes in the church. But God still uses people. And I, and I thank God for that. But in the book of Jonah, in uh, chapter 3. Let me get there here. It's awesome because it talks about, um, you know, the, the king of Nineveh calls all of his people together to put on sackcloth and to pray and to fast and to repent. And God honors that. God honors their request. And then they become that people that was, you know, th this is this is the enemy of the Jews. Realize that he that God is sending him into like Medo-Persia which is like God telling us, hey, you know, why don't you go to Afghanistan? One of those Middle East countries where, you know, Allah is, is to be worshipped and all those things. This is what he's saying. Go over there. And you know what? It's even more far disconnected from that even so because, you know, they, 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 they believe in, in Abraham and all that stuff. But it's even for, far more disconnected than that. It's, you know, like go out into some place that's totally anti Jesus Christ, and that's where, have, where they will kill you on the spot for saying that you're a Christian. That is where I want to send my word. That is where I'm sending you, Jonah. And it's not even so much that. The kicker is, people have already gone there to share the word of God. And they have all died. All of them. Everybody has died. And he says, Jonah, it's your turn. You go down there and share the word. And he's like naming people all the pride. This guy died. 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 All of them heard from the Lord, had a message. But they all got killed. And there Jonah is teaching in Nineveh. Well, before that, he takes off. He goes on the run. And uh, he finds himself in the, in the belly of a great fish as the Bible states. And then once he gets there is where he has an encounter and he cries out to God and God gives him a second chance to make it right, to do what God had told him to do in the first place. 
I'm so grateful for those times. And, and, and you know, one, one thing that, that Jonah does is he says, you know what, God, I'll go. I'll do it. If you want to send me there, I'll go. Because God shows him that, you know what, Jonah, it's not dependent on what you want to do where you have your life. It's me. I'm the one who keeps your life. Just like this fish is supposed to be digesting you. You know what I mean? Digesting you. You're in something's stomach. It's not supposed to come out the same, Right? It's supposed to break apart. Asses eat it all up and stuff. But yet God preserved him in the belly of that great fish. And he's still there. And then he has an encounter. And God says, you know what? You go. And he says, fine, I'll go. Still scared. Still rightly so. But yet he goes anyways. And he preaches the gospel of repentance. Saying, hey, this is what you're doing. This is what you need to do. You need to turn away from those things. And it seems like, ah, they ain't going to do it. And he tells them the word. And then what do they do? They repent. They repent. And they fast. And they pray. And what does Jonah do? He worships God. And he says, thank you. No, he gets all bent out of shape and goes, sits outside the city. Passes out. Gets all mad. Wow. Right? Has a pity party. Yeah, right, he did. He came to those terms of, you know, I wish I probably should have just died. You know, I probably... Right? Save the nation of people. But yet, he was thinking, oh, God, you know, they're like Sodom and Gomorrah. Just burn them up. Just do what you got to do, Lord. You did it once, do it again. You want me to call it out? All right, let's consume them up, Lord. But yet, God chose mercy. And you know what I love about this is because God wanted to have mercy on Nineveh, he had mercy on Jonah. All Jonah could see was that, hey, look at me, look at me. But God's saying, look at those people. They need me. They need what, 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 they, what I have. They need to repent. They need to worship only me. And he's like, God, they're not going to do They're not going to do that. And isn't it like God that, you know, he will choose the people that will not serve him. And some people that do not serve him will choose to serve him. I'm like, man. Because he was being the prophet over there in Israel, too. And they was having some issues. They were starting to turn away. But yet, here's a, a nation far away that has nothing to do with the Lord. But yet, they choose righteousness. They choose to turn away from those things. They ch- choose to serve God. I know what it's like to be like those people, amen? I know what it's like to be like those people. So I thank God that he has mercy on those that may not choose to serve him, but yet he still sends his word and makes an opportunity for them to repent. I leave. So that's what I like to do now. So some of you, you know, uh, we hear about the armor, we read about the armor, we talk about the armor. Uh, We talk about righteousness. We talk about holiness. We talk about all those things. You know, this is an opportunity for us to do something different. For us to just step out, you know, not be like the person in Pastor Mario's story where, you know, you have a uh, sense of godliness, but you're denying the, you know, the fullness thereof. You have a form of godliness. That's great. But God wants you to have the fullness of who He is. He wants you to have the full understanding, the full application, the full power of who He is. So what I would ask you to do is that when you're in your quiet times, when you're in your secret places, or if you'd like to do so now, that way I cover everybody in every place. If you'd like to make that decision to say, you know what, enough is enough. I might not know everything about the armor, I might not know everything about the battle, but I know that I need to choose righteousness. I know that I need to pursue righteousness. I know that I need to put on righteousness. I know that it is paramount for my survival, not only in my faith, but to stand against the enemy. So if there's some people that are bold enough, wherever they are, you know, here, home, work, wherever God moves and and tugs on your heart, I believe that He's already preparing a place, but... Uh, For those of you, if you want to raise your hands or not or come up or don't or whatever you want to do, I just want to make an opportunity for you to make a public declaration to say, you know what, I'm choosing righteousness. 
So I'm standing here letting you know that that's what I want to do. That's what I want to pursue. That's what I want to be. I want to be like the Daniels. I want to be like the Davids. I want to be like the Joshuas. I want to be like the Caleb's. I want to be like those people, not simply because they were great men, but because they served God. Not first, but only served God. Only served God. You know, I said that on Sunday, like we get we get this thing of like, you know, I'm going to serve God and then I'm going to do my family and then I'm going to be a husband and then I'm going to be an employee. Then I'm going to be a brother. What if, I'm just going to serve you and only you, God. And because I only serve you, God, I will be able to be an amazing husband, a father, a son. You know, that's the um, that's the awesome part about our faith. It doesn't take away from your you, who you are. It makes you better in the areas that you are in. It makes you a better husband. It makes you a better father. It makes you a better son. It makes you a better employee. It makes you a better man. It makes you better in all those things. You're a better friend. You're better for all of those things. When you serve the Lord, it doesn't diminish anything. It adds greatness to every area that you are in. Because you're not seeking yourself. You're seeking the Lord in all areas. And that's what I want to do. That's who I want to work with. That's who I want to be around. Amen? That's what I want to do. That's what I want to be about. You know, I believe that that's what Jesus was saying when he was saying, wouldn't you know that I'll be about my father's business? That's part of his father's business is righteousness. When they when they say, hey, your mother and your brothers have something to say to you. Say, who's my mother and my brothers? Right? Those who do the will of God. Those who keep his word. Those who are here to keep it. Those who do the will of the Father. Amen? Hallelujah. So I'm just going to pray for you guys. You can, I guess, stop the recording here. But um, Lord, we just thank you, God. We ask, God, that this message, God, would just not be for this place and this time, God. But this would be something, God, that righteousness, God, is so instrumental, God, that when Abraham exercised faith, God, that it wasn't just simply that him exercising faith, God, but there's something that is different about his actions, God, and there's something amazing that is written in your scriptures, God, because it was a credit to him as righteousness, God. We thank you for your awesome word, God, that that's one of the most awesome and first places, God, that we see this concept in this word written in your in your word, God. We thank you, God, that it's in the beginning in Genesis, God, that we can see, well, what is this righteousness? What is this that we're reading about? What is this that we're hearing about? Who is this Abraham person that we get to see exercise faith and make a step out of nowhere, go against something that he was taught his whole life of serving other gods and seek you and you alone, God, not seeking comfortable place of dwelling Because he had a land, he had a heritage, he had a people. God, but he forsook all of that, God, to seek you, God. God, we thank you, God, that in the seeking, God, that you were able to add to him first righteousness, God, then the promise of faith, God, descendants, God, that you would create a nation unto himself, God. Hallelujah, God. Out of a barren woman, God. Hallelujah, God, out of a barren people, God, out of just something that was unfruitful, God, that you took faith and righteousness and produced excellence, God. We thank you for your awesome story, God, that you used those people, God, and for people like Rahab, God, for the prostitute, God, for the woman that chose to assist the people of God rather than to assist the ungodly people from who she was living amongst, God. We thank you, God, for her faithfulness, God, for that one act, God, of obedience, God, that it wasn't just stopping at that, God, but it was a sign to show that she was repenting from what she had become who she was God and that she was able to serve you God that she was able to be engrafted into your people God that you put up a scarlet God uh, a signal God outside of that window God to show that this place is different than all other places God that anyone in that room God was safe God but the whole city the whole place the whole dwelling God was destroyed God but there was a sign that said preserve these people God and we thank you God for using that woman God because it was through her obedience God that she placed herself in not just any kingdom God but in the direct 
direct lineage of Jesus Christ, God. What a testimony, God. What a testimony. What an awesome word, God, that we can look back into genealogy and see that Rahab is in there. Hallelujah, God, that she would be able to bear a fruitful son, God. Somebody that is esteemed, well thought of, a Boaz, God. Hallelujah, God, that out of him would come Obed and Jesse and David, God. We praise you, God, for the beauty of your word, God, that you are able to take, God, those discarded things, God, and that you are able to turn the hearts of people, God, into vessels, God, that would hold your word, God, and want to serve you, God, and pursue righteousness, God. And out of those ashes, God, even as Nehemiah, God, out of those ashes, God, that he was able to take that which was out of the fire and the discards, God, and build your kingdom, God. Likewise, God, you are able to rescue out of the flame, out of the nothingness of this world, God, and build your kingdom with it, God. Hallelujah, God. We just thank you, God, for your awesome word, God, for the foreshadowing, God, throughout the generations in the Bible, God, that we can see those things, God, even to Mother Brown, God, that we can see your faithfulness, God, even at our home church, God. Hallelujah, God, that we can see the testimony of a life, God. Hallelujah, God. Knowing that you... And you alone are the faithful one. And you were the one that was able, God, to take her not only through the years, God, but through the decades. Hallelujah, God. In health and in sickness, for better or for worse. Hallelujah. In riches and in poorness. Hallelujah, God. Those sound like marriage vows, God, but they are your everlasting promise to your people, God. That you are with us in sickness, God. You are with us in health, God. You are with us in the good times. You are with us in the bad times. For better or for worse, you are with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us, God. We thank you for the sacredness, God, of the marriage vows, God. And not only that, God, for more so, God, your covenant with your people, God, knowing that you are not a man, that you would lie to us, God, that there is no such thing as divorce, God, as compared to you, God, that you're not just one that would just disown your people, God. Hallelujah, God, but we thank you, God, for your awesome promise, God, for your awesome promise, God, for the story of the prodigal son, God, for one that thought that he knew better and that he would be able to find his own way, God. Hallelujah, God, for those throughout the churches that are in that similar place, God, let them know, God, first of all, that that father is the heavenly father and that that wayward son is like the one that would want to pursue the ways of the world but yet he knows better hallelujah god and even to the other son that would sit there and serve with the father and not leave his place yet he had the animosity the audacity to rise up and speak against the father when he was rejoicing when he was in great cheer and joy because his son had returned god let them know god first of all that they have a heavenly father that is watching and waiting for the son to return hallelujah god we thank you god that you do not give up on us god we thank you god that you do not give in god that you don't give up God, that you are the same, God, that your word, God, that as we have breath, God, let us understand that it is still an opportunity for the heart to turn, for the mind to be renewed, for the marriage to be restored, for all those things, God, where there is death, God, that it is able to be transformed into life, God. Hallelujah, God, that every day that we open our eyes, when our feet hit the floor, as Mother Brown said, that is an opportunity for you to do your work, God, for your word to become manifest in our lives, God. We praise you, God, and we thank you for your everlasting promise, God, that your word will not go out void, but it will accomplish that which it has set out to do, God. 